All right, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, this is Senki Lee. I think everybody knows me. I'm in the PHOD uh, AOML. So today I'm gonna to talk about the global meridional overturning circulation inferred from a data constrained ocean sea ice model. So I'd like to acknowledge my, the contributor of this work, uh, uh, first name, only first name, because there's too many. Rick, Malos, Molly, Chris, Shampoo, Hosme, and Steve Viega from uh, NCAR. So here is my uh, outline for my talk today. So the global meridian overturning circulation is the, uh, it is also known as a great, uh, the great ocean conveyor belt, and it carries uh, important ocean tracers such as uh, heat, salt, uh, carbon, and nutrient components and they it redistribute them between the hemisphere and across the ocean basin. So it is a very important components of the global heat, salt, and carbon and nutrient budget. So our current understanding of the uh, global uh, MOC uh, is largely based on the observation-based study. So I'm not just saying the observation because there's more into that observation. So it's observ I'm gonna call it observation-based studies. So uh, for instance, uh, Lumpkin and Spear 2007, uh, they applied the inverse uh, techniques to hydrographic sections uh, coming from the World Ocean Circulation Experiment and used, also used the surface heat flux uh, from the NCV analysis to compute the global MLC. Uh, for instance, this is the 18 hydrographic sections used in Lumpkin and Spear 2007. And uh, similar work has been also carried out by many others, uh, especially Tali et al. Uh, 2003. Okay, so however, this observation-based studies have some problems. Limitations, not the problem, limitations. Uh, because uh, these uh, uh, global MOC computed by the uh, Lumpkin and Spear is subject to large spatio-temporal sampling errors due to this one-time synoptic observation of this uh, uh, hydropic sections used. Uh, for instance, and, and also this, uh, uh, they use only two uh, journal transects at uh, 32 degrees south and uh, 62 uh, degrees south uh, to estimate the overturning circulation in the southern Indian Ocean, uh, South Pacific, and Southern Oceans. So, and then also another point is that the hydro peak sections used here is collected mostly during the summer months and, and also in the 1990s. Therefore, there is uh, still a uh, we still need to fill this large spatial temporal gaps uh, in the observation-based estimate. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is that if this is the uh, global returning circulation from Lumpkin and Spear, basically we have a measurement here, a measurement here, in between is basically linear interpolation. So we like to know what happened between the transact. Okay, so to fill this gap, spatial temporal gap, we can think about using the general circulation model, but general circulation model also has a lot of issues. Uh, for instance, what I'm showing you here is the uh, Atlantic MOC or AMOC, AMOC uh, stream function at 26.5 degree north. So this green line here is from the observation, rapid MOCA array uh, here. This is a stream function. And then this red line here is from a surface, surface force ocean model. I'm going to talk about, you know, more details about this particular model, but basically this model get this maximum transport right around 70 square drop. But if you look at the structure below 1,000 meter, it's not very good. So you can see that, you know, this, this is stream function. Stream function means stream, stream function. So this the gradient here is very basically transport. So you can see that from thousand meter to to the bottom, you see it's almost in the observation is almost kind of linear. So which means that we have kind of a constant transport profiles of transport going southward. But in the model, it looks like this all septic spread of that goes north is actually compensated by this what happened in the upper three thousand meter. And then, of course, there are some flows below 3,000 meter, like two spur drop, but that is also compensated by what happened below, uh, below this, uh, uh, you know, in the bottom flow. So basically, what it means is that so this this part, 1,000 meter to 3,000 meter, 
is roughly north low upper North Atlantic deep water, which is mainly formed in the Labrador and the Arminger Sea. And uh, roughly, uh, what happened below 3,000 meter is coming from it's we can call it lower North Atlantic deep water, uh, largely coming from the uh, the outflow of dense water that are formed in the Greenland, Iceland, and Norwegian Sea. So we call it Gin Sea, G I N C. So, uh, but so so what it shows is that the model, uh, the uh, the lower North Atlantic deep water coming from the Gin Sea is pretty small. It's kind of almost not nothing there. So that and then uh, uh, and then there is uh, too much of the uh, upper North Atlantic deep water coming from the Labrador Sea and Arminger Sea. So that could be a problem because uh, what it does is that so. So in, in observation, we have this uh, relatively warmer uh, water mass going south and the relatively uh, colder water mass going, going south too. But in the model, it's all about this relatively warm uh, upper North Atlantic deep water going south. So if you think about it in terms of heat transport and budget, it's transporting too much of the warm water toward the south in the model. So that will make the North Atlantic north of this latitude, too cold, and the south of this latitude, too warm. So that was reported in, the, uh, in our earlier paper in 2014, and that seems to be kind of uh, uh, related to the um, a global ocean, global model SSD bias patterns. And what is interesting is that uh, this uh, Dana Blue et al. 2014 16, they show that this is not just a problem in this particular model, it's a common issue in all kind of a, all surface portion model as well as a fully coupled model. Not all, but most of them has this a similar issue. So we need to fill the gaps, special temporal gaps in the observation, but the model has a lot of issue. So what do we do? So I'm introducing a method called uh, robust diagonal simulation. So I'm putting, I, I said reintroducing because it's not really new methodology, it's a it's really old methodology. So, but this is, was used in 1980s, 90s, but nobody used afterwards. So I'm kind of reintroducing that. So main goal of this study here is to fill the spatial temporal gaps in our understanding of the uh, global MOC by using a data constraint, which is robust diagonal simulation, or in, a, in another way, it's bias corrected ocean model. So this robust diagonal simulation was first used by Samiento and Brian in 1982. And before that, it, this method used to be called diagnostic method. Uh, but uh, that was really bad. It's not very good. So they actually uh, improved a little bit. So they introduced a name, robust diagonal simulation. Basically, how what we did was that the temperature salinity in the surface ocean for surface ocean CS model is corrected toward the uh, World Ocean Atlas 13 monthly climatology with the e-folding time of five years. That's basically what it is. It's very simple. Just we're correcting the temperature and salinity in the model toward observation, long-term average observation. And then we use the uh, NCARS uh, Community Earth System model, only the ocean and sea ice components. And for the atmosphere, it is surface force. It is coming from the ECMW at 20th century view analysis. So this technique, this, so I'm going to call it DIAG, D-I-A-G. Uh, this technique was used previously mainly for the Atlantic Ocean to reconstruct the uh, ocean current there and then also MOC. But most of the papers are 80s and 90s. But I don't think this technique was ever used for the global ocean to study the global MOC uh, outside the Atlantic domain, but uh, I could be wrong. All right, so let me just give you a, a brief summary of what we found here in the that robust diagonal simulation. So here, this one is basically, I showed you earlier, this is the uh, AMOC, stream function at 26.5 degree north. This is green is observation and red is model. Now here is the same one. So the green is observation, same, same one, same, same uh, stream function. 
but this blue here is the uh, robust diagonal simulation. So you can see that this southward transport between 1,000 meter to 3,000 meter is much better agreement with the observation. And also uh, uh, transport below 3,000 meter also agree pretty, pretty well. Of course, there's some problems here. You see that uh, this uh, maximum transport here is kind of shipped this uh, downward in the model. But other than that, it looks much better. So in the later slide, basically, I'm going to show you the uh, global overturning circulation in the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Southern Ocean, and the Indo-Pacific Ocean separately. And uh, But before I show you, uh, I just want to remind you that uh, it is really important to look at the MOC intensity coordinates because the water mass, any water mass, uh, may uh, occupy different uh, depth range in a different places. So looking at the described in the MOC in Z coordinate is basically could be misleading. So we always it's always better to look at in the look at it in the density coordinates. If you have any question, let me know. Okay, first, uh, so so this is a stream function of the uh, radar overturning circulation. This is average over the Atlantic Ocean, and this is entire longitude. This is the Southern Ocean. So there is a, there got to be discontinuity uh, here at thirty five degree uh, south. This is kind of we we this is how we how 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 I uh, separate the Southern Ocean and. Uh, uh, from the rest of the ocean basins. So there's they definitely, there has to be discontinuity there. Okay, so, uh, so it's a density coordinate, sigma two. Um, what I'm showing you here is the transport at 26.5 north. And this, uh, this line here is the at 30 degrees south. So it gives you the value here. This is value here for different uh, density classes. So you can see that at 26.5 degree north, we have total of uh, about 70 superdrop, and that's pretty much consistent with the uh, earlier studies, earlier observation-based studies, and also rapid MOCAR uh, arrays. And that if we divide this uh, density layer into the warm surface water, intermediate depth water, and the uh, upper North Atlantic deep water and lower North Atlantic deep water. So we have about 10 border going north here in the, in the surface. And then we have about 6.9 bird drop uh, in the intermediate depth water. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, upper North Atlantic deep water that will compensate uh, in the going southward here, uh, about 9.4. And the lower uh, North Atlantic deep water is about 7.7 .7 here. So, uh, so, so you can see that there is a two distinctive sinking regions here. One in the Lavalado and Armingo Sea, and, you know, based on the latitude. And also this is the Jin Sea here. So as you can see, uh, it's, they're very separable. And then uh, what is interesting here is that this is very dense water. It's formed in the Jin Sea. And when it comes out, it mixed with the uh, uh, ambient, uh, the, the lighter water in the environment and become lighter. And then it form a North Atlantic, form the uh, lower part of the North Atlantic deep water. And that transport is, is roughly uh, a half of the total uh, southward return flow of the MOC here. And, uh, and then you can see that once uh, they're formed, here, from here, and then uh, there's very little mixing between the two water mass and go southward like that. Okay, and then this basically, uh, this whole uh, circulation pathway and the, the magnitudes are pretty much consistent with observations. Yeah? No questions? Okay. So let's move on to the South Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so it's basically the same picture. I'm just moving on to the South Atlantic part. 
So at 30 degrees south, we have about 70 spur drop. And that is kind of consistent with the Lumpkin and Spear, and also uh, Dong et al. and Casoli et al. Uh, in a previous independent measurement, it's kind of uh, consistent, this total. And uh, hey, somebody left. <laughs> and then uh, warm surface water is about uh, 9.1 spur drop going north. And uh, we know that it's coming from the aqueous leakage mainly. And I didn't actually calculate the aqueous leakage because it's kind of really difficult thing to do. So I didn't, it just, uh, I'm just pretty there for you to have an idea where it's coming from. And then we have an intermediate depth water uh, is about 7.8 spur drop. It's mainly Antarctic intermediate water from the density class and also a little bit from the upper circumpolar deep water. And then this water, I'm not showing you, I, I don't have a plot to show you, but the, this uh, intermediate depth water has a very distinctive characteristics of very cold and fresh water. So you can actually see this cold, uh, this uh, low salinity tongue extended all the way, uh, you know, toward the equator, but it after the after the equator toward the north, uh, that minimum salinity kind of disappear, which means that there's a lot of mixing going on after it is introduced to the South Atlantic Ocean. And Mediterranean outflow also. Hmm? And Mediterranean outflow also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And then, um, and then you can also see that in the South Atlantic Ocean. You see this portion here in the Southern Ocean, this is, we can call it a Oh uh, yeah, this 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 uh, this local water mass here in the southern ocean is called the circumpolar deep water, and uh, you can see that this uh, north Atlantic deep water is a major source for this uh, circumpolar deep water. You can see that this connection uh, is very well connected across this 35 degree north south south, and then especially this lower north Atlantic deep water is a main major source of the lower circumpolar deep water, which eventually move up to the subway through the through the window valley system and then sink down near the uh, antarctica to form the uh, um, antarctic deep, uh, antarctic bottom water formation so so you see that you see it's very, very a nice connection uh, between the north atlantic deep water which is main source of the circumpolar deep water and sinks down to the uh, to form the antarctic, Ant antarctic bottom water okay yeah. Oops. Okay, next one is the Southern Ocean. Yeah, this is the uh, stream function, uh, major stream function average over the Indo Pacific Ocean here. And this is the Southern Ocean. So it's the same as the earlier plots. And you can see that uh, in the Southern Ocean, you can see, you can see this is the Southern Oops, where is it? Southern overturning cell here. And this uh, Antarctic water formation formation is huge, like a 35 spurter, which is really big, big number. And because it's a big number, because all year study shows that it's got to be like 20 or even less. So it was a big surprise for me to find that it's like a 35 spur drop, it's huge. And then, but interesting thing is that the most of them, like a two third of, the, third of them actually recirculate within uh, the Southern Ocean and only, you know, small portion, 12.6 spur drop actually go northward across the 35 uh, degrees south. And then this recirculation interesting because there's no observation no observation evidence to support supports it. So this could be really brand new, or it could be something wrong <laughs> in the model. <laughs> so that I cannot tell. So, uh, but it, I, I think it's worthwhile to take a further look at it. Uh, uh, because this, this basically means there's a very big difference between Antarctic water, water mass formation and the transport across the, uh, the there's big differences. Okay, so but observation basically can tell you because observation doesn't have you know uh, transacts everywhere. So.
So uh, I cannot tell you that. And also, I think I probably already told you about it, but this this water here, Antarctic bottom water. Oh, okay. So Antarctic bottom is formed and then it mixed with the lighter water. That's why it becomes lighter. And then and it, it enters the Indo-Pacific Ocean in the, as a bottom flow here. And uh, you can call it Antarctic bottom water, but it's much lighter. So you can call it something else, but uh, it really depends on, uh, I look at the literature, but they have a, very different name for it. So we just, to simplify, I just we're going to just call it Antarctic bottom water, but some other people may call it a different way. Okay, so then on all this all year observation study show that it, it's got to be around 20, 25 spur drop, uh, you know, across to here. Uh, but there is a, a Sloyan and, and Wintow in 2001 suggested uh, 46, but this one is kind of outlier but the rest of the study all say the 21 to 25 or six like that. But basically model is kind of underestimating that. Okay, so let's move on to in the Pacific Ocean. So you see that if you were wondering why I didn't separate into Indian Ocean and Pacific, it's really difficult to do that when it comes to MOC because there is an Indonesian throw flow. So there's a divergent component to, to it. And also this argillus current and everything is about tropics. So it's really messy if you separate it. So I decide to combine everything, look at it uh, as a one, one ocean in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so you can see that I already talked about it. This uh, Antarctic bottom water mixed with the lighter water, then exported to the, in the, in the uh, mainly to the Indo-Pacific Ocean. And then, uh, to me, this pattern in the Pacific Ocean was a very uh, new to me. Uh, I'm not really an MOC person. I only have a couple of papers in MOC, so I'm not really an MOC person. But uh, I, before I was starting to working on this uh, work, I didn't really know that there are significant MOC in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. I never knew it. So to me, it was a big surprise that there is a very vigorous MOC in the Indo-Pacific Ocean in this model. It was very surprising to me. So let me describe it. It's very complicated. So this Antarctic bottom, a very cold Antarctic bottom water coming into the Indo-Pacific Ocean, and it become lighter. It mixed with the local water, and then tally call it diffusion. And uh, through, through the diffusion, it become much lighter and uh, this, this wide range of this water uh, density, uh, range of the density water mass here, we call it Pacific deep water or, or in Indian deep water. So this become lighter, Wait, where is it? Goes? And then goes up into the Southern Ocean and it feeds the upper circumpolar deep water, not the lower circumpolar deep water. Lower circumpolar deep water here, this part here, this is coming from the Atlantic, North Atlantic deep water. And the North Atlantic deep water from the Atlantic comes here, sink down here, form the Atlantic, uh, Antarctic deep bottom water, and coming into the Indo-Pacific, and then becomes lighter and feed the upper circumpolar deep water. And some of them become uh, Antarctic, Antarctic intermediate water. And then some of them actually uh, just stay as a upper circumpolar deep water, and then are coming into the uh, Pacific Ocean. And then uh, it's, it's 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 very complicated from here too because this goes out, and some of them, some of this water, upper circumpolar deep water or the Antarctic intermediate water, uh, fresher formed in the upper ocean, actually coming back into the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Mainly, I guess, mainly, well, Indo-Pacific Ocean. And then you, you see that this is this circulation patterns here is called a subtropical shallow overturning cell, right? This is this is called a subtropical shallow overturning circulation. It's basically wind-driven current, and you see that what's coming here here is is below that uh, uh, this. Uh, overturning, uh, the wind-induced overturning circulation, shallow overturning circulation. This 
water comes back into the uh, into the Indo Pacific Ocean, and you can see that actually some of them, some of this water is actually actually directly coming from the Pacific Deep Water, and then it is actually transported all the way to the Equatorial Pacific, and then goes up through the Equatorial Pacific uh, abutting system, and uh, this is very interesting because. The, the water that was formed in the far away in the Gene Sea traveled all the way down to the South Atlantic and go to the Southern Ocean and go up and go down to the deep ocean and coming back to the Indo-Pacific Ocean and goes back, some of them goes back to the Southern Ocean and then they go through to the uh, surface water through the Equatorial Pacific uh, orbiting system. Very complicated. But I think uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting, very interesting, uh, this pat pattern is there. And so after I was looking at it, I was wondering why nobody's looking at the MOC in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. It's, it's, it's pretty big and uh, got to be very important. So anyway, so this, uh, this warm surface water that is formed here by the equatorial. You said something? No? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Good, good, good answer. Yeah, and then they actually go. This surface water actually has to go 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 back through the Indo Indonesian trough flow and Agulhas current, and and goes back to Southern Ocean. And we know that some of them actually goes back to the uh, Southern uh, to the South Atlantic through the Agulhas leakage. So very complicated, uh, but very vigorous. Uh, Overturning circulation is happening in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Okay, so before I give you, this is a short presentation, so uh, I'm not gonna go, go all the way to 45 minutes, but before I show you the summary plot, uh, let me give you, show you some, some brief, you know, uh, summary of uh, what happened if I don't correct temperature salinity. So this is a pure model. And this, I already show you here. This is the robust diagonal simulation. Uh, if you look at it, like from the distance, uh, it doesn't look so bad. Yeah, it doesn't look so bad. Uh, but if you look at really detail, there are a lot of, lot of differences. Uh, for instance, uh, so let me see. This is southward MOC return flow in this model. You see that uh, there's a very little water actually formed in the Gene Sea and coming through, uh, through the outflow here, a very small amount of it. And then, uh, so it's a, most of the water, uh, most of the uh, North Atlantic deep water is formed in the uh, Labrador Sea and Gene Sea, I mean, uh, Labrador Sea and Domingo Sea here. And then it actually it's become more heavier here and then become probably, we can call it lower North Atlantic deep water and going back. And then another interesting thing is that this doesn't feed the uh, lower circumpolar deep water in the Southern Ocean. So it is not the source. So North Atlantic deep water is not a source of the uh, uh, circumpolar deep water in the, uh, um, it's not a direct source of the circumpolar deep water in the Southern Ocean. Uh, yeah. Denser water for to mix with in a sense. Mixing with the uh, bottom water, which you can see there, there isn't. Is there? There's a small amount of it there, which you don't see in the bottom water. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. It's it, it, it's yeah. supposed. I I I suspect that it's it's yeah. it's kind of mixing here and then. Uh, what? Yeah, it's yeah. So yeah, this control was not very clear, but it's definitely there is something there. I mean, yeah, there is some. Definitely this uh, bottom water uh, coming here. And then uh, it's not connected very well. So that's very interesting. So, in, so what it means is that this sudden overturning cell is kind of a independent, kind of disconnected from the, what's happening in the upper circulation, upper overturning circulation. And then uh, you can compare this with the uh, uh, diagnostic uh, simulations. Okay, let's take a look at the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Big surprise. There's nothing, nothing in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. I don't know what to say about this. 
I don't know how to describe about this. Uh, so there's very little water coming into the Indo-Pacific. And then this, whatever that comes in, has to go up and go to the equatorial availing system. But that, that pathway is very uh, unclear here. And I don't know what to say about it. So this whole things about this heavy water has to transform into the uh, lighter water to close the uh, global overturning cell. It is not there in the model. Is, is there just less Antarctic bottom water being formed, or is it just less being recirculated in the un, undiag in the normal? Mm, yeah, so it's it's difficult to say that it's, it's, this uh, recirculation pattern is a real pattern or or whatever. But yes, it's, it's true that the formation is much less, and the much less water is going north too. So both both are true. And um, yeah, there you go. But in the in the upper upper layer, it looks pretty similar. So anyway, so. So this is interesting because I, that this mismatch between these two uh, picture lead to two questions led to two questions to me. One is, how about the other surface force model and fully coupled model? Do they have the same issues in the in the Pacific? I have no idea. So I think that's something that we need to take a look. Number two, so what will be the effect of the not resolving? this uh, global overturning circulation in the fully coupled model. The, so my question is, if we correct the uh, Indo-Pacific, the global overturning circulation in the model, what will be the consequences in the atmosphere? Uh, that we can, I cannot tell you because this is surface force model. It had to be coupled with the uh, atmosphere model to do that. So that's kind of future work. All right. So this is a new summary, summary schematic. Took me a long time to produce it. So, uh, well, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing because I already talked about it. Just give you some brief, uh, you know, general direction. So, so this deep water is formed in Labrador Sea, Gin Sea, and then they comes to the um, uh, Southern Ocean and, and it's brought up to the surface through the, uh, uh, to, to the Southern Ocean Availing System, Windy Driven Availing System, sinks down near the, uh, the Antarctica, especially in the Weddell Sea and also Ross Sea. And then some of them recirculates back, but uh, the rest of them actually go, goes to Indo-Pacific Ocean and then uh, becomes lighter by, through the uh, diffusion process. And some of them goes back to the Southern Ocean to feed the upper circumpolar deep water and some of them actually goes directly to the uh, to the surface, and then to the surface, and uh, and some of this circumpolar deep water, upper circumpolar deep water, comes back as Antarctic intermediate water, which is fresh water, uh, a very fresh water, and this about 6.5 uh, submerged is actually brought to the surface below the South Pacific subtropical shallow overturning circulation that below it. And is brought to the equator, uh, to the surface through the equatorial, equatorial Pacific availing system, and then they are carried back to the Southern Ocean through the uh, in, uh, Indonesian trough flow and Aguilas current, and then back to the South South Atlantic Ocean through the Aguilas leakage, and the whole cycle uh, repeat again. So very complicated and to me uh, personally uh, I learned a lot about what happened in the Pacific I never I know that there was something but I never really read any paper about it there's not many paper about it by the way yeah I've never seen model based paper on this but this is to me it was very interesting because it it was very complicated but very you know large amplitude uh, MOC is going on in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, very interesting. So that's it. And uh, I have two more slides. So summary is uh, probably, uh, uh, I would just put it there because I probably I will just repeat myself. So so I, I just want to, there are a lot of points to, to make, but uh, the 
the two conclusion, two main conclusion was that there is a very complex and vigorous habit to water, habit to light water mass transformation going on in the Indo-Pacific Ocean, and uh, that is uh, not very well resolved in the ocean model. Uh, so uh, that was a big conclusion to me. And the uh, outflow of the dense water that is formed in the GNC has to entrain the lighter water to form the lower North Atlantic deep water, and which in turn contribute about roughly half of the southward return flow of the MLC. So it's, just, it's not just the Labrador Sea, it's the GNC. What happened in GNC is very, very important. Okay, so this is so this result are consistent with the previous model-based studies, but poorly captured in the surface force ocean model simulation. So there are other, thing, other things, uh, you know, some more detailed circulation patterns, which you cannot actually get it from the observation-based studies. We have a couple of things, but I'll just uh, move on. So the last slide, uh, okay, oh, one more slide. So this work was supported by uh, uh, CPO, CBP program. I greatly appreciate this uh, support. And then a future work. So, so this paper was actually submitted. Uh, so I'm, we got a major revision, so we're re revising the paper. Once this paper is accepted, what I want to do is I want to move on and turn on the biogeochemical uh, module of the CSM to repeat this calculation uh, to basically to learn how this correcting the MOC in the Atlantic and the in the Indo-Pacific will correct the carbon budget in the global ocean. So I'd like to work with my, my uh, collaborators and in the ocean acidification project um, program people and then my collaborators in the Southeast Fisher Science Center, Michael Sharipa and uh, Francis, Francesca. And another thing is to, I already talked about it, but uh, I want to turn on the atmosphere and land components of it. Uh, while I, while we're correcting the uh, MOC. So we like to see how the correcting the MOC will affect the atmosphere. And hopefully that will reduce the bias in the atmospheric and land model. So that's something that our new postdoc Dong Min will probably take over. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll do it this year, uh, this fiscal, next fiscal year, yeah. And then there are a couple of uh, technical things that I want to test it. Uh, I don't, it's not really a, a high priority, but uh, for instance, here is uh, the, uh, I use the long-term average uh, world ocean atlas climatology to relax it, right? Mm. But I can actually do it for the each decade. So I can use the climatology for the 50, 60, it's like that. And I can do the, repeat it to see if we can actually reproduce some time bearing uh, of the uh, global MLC. And then we can also try uh, different techniques to do that. But the most important thing that I, while I was, you know, doing the research, I, I was always thinking it, it has to be redone with the eddy resolving model because this is still a one degree model. So we are correcting temperature salinity and everything, but this is no near inertia transport, eddy transport, ed eddy use transport, this model cannot handle. It. So I'm sure that there are some, there are, uh, there are very big portion of this uh, result that are due to the, this model uh, issue. So that I think we really want to do this, uh, repeat this one with a high resolution model, but that requires another proposal in the future. All right, thank you very much. That's it. Yeah.